while this case is not a criminal one, I think it is just as important. This is one of the cases of Ireland's unidentified and what the people of Ireland care about most, family. Every person in death should be reunited with their family, even if the person in question asks not to be. There is a reason why our wakes and funerals are famous all over the world. You haven't lived until you've either attended a wedding or a funeral in Ireland, as morbid as that may sound. I remember when my grandfather died and the daughter of our local publican had a boyfriend visiting from America at the time of the funeral. We all piled into the pub afterwards. We were all drinking, eating and dancing and the statement was made by said American boyfriend. Gee, they mustn't have liked the guy. He wasn't exactly wrong in his synopsis, but he still got a good send off all the same. So you see, even in death we care and this case will show it extends to the Gardaí in their five-year search to reunite a man with his family that was found dead in Rusheen Woods near Barna in County Galway. To you and me, he will be known as Barna Man. This was a case of whodunit, but in a different sense, in that they couldn't identify who this person was that was found in Rusheen Woods on the 27th of September 2014. He was someone's son, uncle and maybe father, and the Gardaí would spend the next five years trying to find out who he was. Would they be successful? Let's find out. The only thing that's worse than finding out a loved one is deceased is not knowing. As many of you know from the missing persons cases that I and others have explored. The Gardaí from Salt Hill in Galway saw it as a personal challenge to solve this mystery. And many Garda stations around the country could take a leaf out of their book when it comes to determination to find a missing person or identify a body that has been found. The Gardaí did an exceptional job in doing so. They never gave up. Rushing Woods is located on the coastal side of the main road as you travel from Galway City out to Connemara, next to the village of Barna near Silver Strand. It is a popular area with a windsurfing school and a bird sanctuary. It would be a very popular area to walk your dog and so it's frequented by many dog walkers and alike. Rushing Woods would be a very dense with foliage in the height of summer, as you can imagine. And so even by September, this would be the case. A man was out walking his dog when the dog alerted him to something in the woods. As the man approached to where the dog was, he soon realised that there was a body there. He alerted the guardie straight away and soon they were faced with a man lying on the ground propped up against a tree. News spread quite quickly of the body found in the woods. On initial inspection, they determined that the poor man was in situ for several weeks and so facial recognition was not going to be possible. There was no identification, but the body was fully clothed. Some items were found on the body, a five euro note, a 10 pound note sterling, a key, a watch and a note which appeared to be a suicide note, which stated that he did not want to be known. This made the case more complex. There was evidence of a ligature around his neck, which was determined that it was self-inflicted and results of the post-mortem, the Gardaí were satisfied that no third party were involved. Obviously from the note it read that he did not want to be identified. It read, quote, I did it to myself. I don't have any family or friends. So please burn or bury or donate my body to any school of research. Sorry for the trouble. Nobody is going to look for me or miss me, so there is no reason for my name. This to me is heartbreaking, but it also gives an insight into how the mind can go into this depth of depression, to where people that take their own lives truly feel alone and no one will miss them when the opposite is true. The Gardaí though decided to go against the man's wishes and set about to try and identify who he was. So they started with what they knew about him. He was over six foot tall. He was a large man. He had dark hair and he was Caucasian. And the note he left was written in English. They first went through the National Missing Persons database, but it had no results. They looked at his clothes and the jacket they determined was made in the US and only distributed in the US and Canada. The watch was next to be examined 
and again the manufacturing was US based. It was only ever sold in the US or Canada and never in the European market. So these two combinations were US based and the deceased had either spent time in America or was based there and in Ireland as a tourist or living here. The post-mortem also determined that his remains had been in Russian woods for up to six weeks, which would bring us back to the time of the Galway races. The Galway races is a pinnacle time for visitors to Ireland from all corners of the world, including the US, and so every hotel, hostel and B&B were inquired upon to know if anyone that matched the description had stayed with them and went missing. Even though there was a strong connection to the US, the Gardaí kept an open mind. It was obvious that the man had stayed in Ireland, as he had a single door key on him, but it was a copy of a key with no serial number, which again made it harder to trace. They started off in Galway, trying to trace this key, and expanded outwards but with no luck. The media coverage on this case was huge, and everyone wanted to know who Barnum Man was. The Gardaí decided to reach out to the US for help, as they had exhausted all avenues here in Ireland. This was a total disaster. They carried out police to police inquiries, but once the US police force became aware that it was not a criminal investigation, they had no interest. Even though it wasn't a criminal investigation, the Gardaí felt they had an obligation to find out who this man was. The US police force didn't feel the same way. The US would go as so far, but then the Gardaí would hit barriers once they found out it wasn't a criminal case, and they were baffled as to why Gardaí were wasting time on identifying a body, that it was not something they would do. So it's not just our system that needs to change. The US locate unidentified bodies all the time. They are stored for a period of time in freezers. They are then buried or cremated if go unclaimed. This makes me very sad. Are we gone this inhumane that we just dispose of people like they were nothing and never belonged to anyone? I know resources are limited. It's just very sad. Dealing with different authorities around the world, it led to Gardaí to realise a unique aspect of policing in Ireland. Gardaí are ingrained in the communities of Ireland and it humanises them to keep it in mind that they are dealing with a human being, that they belong to someone once. In Ireland, we have a dual role in the Garda Síochána that they don't have in other countries. Even in sudden deaths that are not suspicious, they still assist the coroner to establish who the person was, when did they die, how did they die, and where did they die. And this is why Barnaman was still an open case. Next, Gardaí turned to forensics. A muscle sample taken from the body was sent to extract DNA, and it was put into the national and international database. In the Irish National Database at the time, they had 140 families in search of a loved one, but it deemed no results. Fingerprints were also distributed with no results. It was a total dead end. Two years after the death of Barnaman in 2016, the Gardaí were no closer to identifying who he was or where his next of kin were. But their next step was clear. It was time to take him to his final resting place. He was buried in an unmarked grave in Galway. It was so sad that he arrived in Ireland and especially Galway, which is known for its welcome and friendliness, that he didn't find his way here and he took it upon himself to take his own life. Because of Ireland's unique approach to death, it should be dealt with with dignity and compassion and so this was the driving force for the Gardaí to give this man both things and reach a conclusion. Even though Barnaman was now buried, the search went on. The team worked harder than ever. Facial reconstruction was the next step and x-rays and scans of the skull were sent to the University of Dundee. The Gardaí had used this technique before on a man that was found, finally identified just a week before Barnaman's body was discovered. They had spent eight years trying to identify him. When they had the facial reconstruction done, and distributed the photographs across media and Interpol. A brother of the deceased had recognised him in a newspaper in Germany and he was reunited with his family. So the Gardaí were hoping to do the same again. Also a tooth had been taken from the body and this was sent to Glasgow University to be analysed. Radiocarbon dating was done on the tooth 
to show the age of the person and another method that can reveal vital biographical information. It was determined that Barnaman was possibly between 43 and 48 years of age and came from a low rain area. The facial reconstruction was also now complete and for the first time the Gardaí had an image to distribute in order to help identify him. A public appeal was made on Crime Call. So many people came forward claiming they may have recognised him. The Gardaí got names and addresses and the like and each of these tips were investigated. One promising lead they got was from a woman whose husband went missing in 2014 and he even looked like the photo fit. Weight, height and age matched and of course timeline. DNA samples were taken from this woman's daughters and unfortunately they didn't match. Also as a result of the media appeal, a US driver's license was found in Galway between Barna and the location to where the body was found. It was handed in to the Garda station in Salt Hill. A US driver's license is a bit different to ours. It has age, eye colour and height and everything matched to Barna Man. The Gardaí contacted the police in America and asked them to do a welfare check of the person named on the licence and so they did. He was safe and well fortunately for the man but for the Gardaí in Ireland it was a case of another dead end. The Gardaí were not giving up and they contacted the FSI which is the Forensic Science Ireland once again to ask is there another avenue they could go down. Biographical ancestry and phenotyping was to be another piece of the puzzle. This would be a very expensive process, but it was paid for and work was done. The DNA screening was to take place in Spain and it was discovered that Barnaman was not from America, but he was Eastern European. This narrowed down the pool of possibilities and took America out of the equation. The investigation moved again closer to home. By 2019, the team had spent five years trying to identify the body found in Rusheen Woods. More local appeals were put out once again and it would be a chance conversation that would bring a resolution to the mystery of Barnaman and his real identity. In July 2019, a local man that worked as a manager of a factory in Galway was on a trip with a Polish colleague and he started telling him the story of another Polish man that had rented a room in a house he was staying in, that he had left his belongings behind and just disappeared one day and never returned. The manager said to him, did you ever hear of Barnaman? The Polish man said he had never heard of him. So the manager sent him a link and when they got home, the Polish man followed up on the story and took a trip to Salt Hill Garda station. The man told them the story of a Polish man that came to stay with them in August of 2014. They had advertised a room to rent on a Polish website and they received a phone call from a man in Dublin who said he'd take the room. He arrived later that day after getting the bus from Dublin to Galway. They didn't see much of him, he kept to himself, and around three or four weeks later, he just didn't come home one day. He kept to himself so much that it took a couple of days before the other housemates realised he was gone. They checked his room and they found a bag on the bed, packed, with a note on the bedside table written in Polish. It basically said, if I'm not back, dump my bag and re-advertise my room. Amongst his belongings was his passport and comparing it to the EFIT, the Gardaí felt there was enough resemblance that this could possibly be their Barnaman. They next went back to the key that was found on the body and wanted to see would it fit the landlord's door lock. If the key fitted, the Gardaí would finally crack the case. When they asked the landlord about the front door key, he stated that they had changed the locks in 2014, but it turned out they had kept the original lock barrel and when the Gardaí put the key in the lock, it turned. Finally, they had proof that the man in the woods was Theodora Brusko. He was a Polish national who had spent the majority of his life in the US, mainly Florida. He had gone there with his sister and for some unknown reason, he decided to come to Ireland in early 2014. He had stayed in a hostel in Dublin. He had applied for a PPS number, which is a social security number to some of you listening. So it seems he was set on setting up a new life here. But for some reason, this all changed when he decided to go to Galway. 
Gardy established contact with Theodore's family near Warsaw in Poland and they informed them of a body being found in Ireland, believed to be their family member. DNA was given and a few days later it was confirmed it was their son. Both his parents were still alive and they were devastated to hear the news. They remained a close family but contact with Theodore was sporadic and they were not prepared for the news. His mother was so grief stricken upon hearing the news that she collapsed in grief. To think poor Theodore had died five and a half years earlier and they had no idea. It doesn't bear thinking about. Theodore's family wrote a heartfelt letter to the Gardaí in Galway to thank them for what they had done for their son. It gave the Gardaí an insight into Theodore's sometimes troubled personal history. He was a son, brother and uncle. Theodore had not spoken to them in a long time. He had left Poland in 1990, shortly after the falling of the communist regime in the country. He went to America with his sister to carve out a new life for himself. Things did not go well for him over there and he decided to travel back to Europe, but he did not want to go home to Poland. And because he spoke such good English, he had a choice of the UK or Ireland and he chose Ireland. He would often move addresses, but he would contact the family to let them know. Unfortunately, this time, when he moved to Ireland, he did not let them know. The family would say, unfortunately, we found out where he was after the fact, and not through Theodore, but through the Irish police. The family would say he was always the first to help. If he heard that someone at home needed money or any kind of help, he was the first to offer it. He was always ready to help everybody. It's a pity that he was never one to ask for help himself. He didn't want to be a burden to others, to burden his family with his problems. Even we can see this about him in the note he wrote before his death. Finally, in 2021, the inquest into Theodore's death and the work put in to find out who he was, was held. It was the final chapter of the case of Theodore's life and death. Theodore finally has a name on his gravestone and a place where his family can come and visit. His family have left him here with the people of Ireland and we are grateful and honoured to have him. We are just sorry that we never knew him before he died.